This is the Aftermarket Radio Network. Welcome, everyone, to yet another episode of Diagnosing the Aftermarket A to Z. I'm Matt Fonslow, and tonight I have three guests, but you don't need to know who they are. This is kind of a a follow-up episode to an episode recorded on the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast with none other than Sean Tipping. How's it going, Matt? (laughs) It's going really good. Along with Brian Pollock and Matthew Skundrich. And we talked about charging for diagnostic time. And it kind of led to an interesting conversation, or at least the beginnings of a conversation, something we want to finish up tonight or at least delve in deeper is, is there a time where you kind of stop charging for diag time and start charging for training time? Or do you not charge at all? And where that line kind of exists? Before we get rolling here too far, let me just quick thank our sponsor, Napa Auto Tech Training. Are you tired of searching for trained technicians? If so, let Napa Auto Tech help you build a technician like Build-A-Bear with their Build-A-Tech program. This three-day course covers one of four topics, brakes, electrical, steering and suspension, or HVAC, through a combination of classroom lecture, hands-on, and utilizing training mock-ups. Visit NapaAutotech.com. You should explain how we ended up on this rabbit trail because you mentioned something with how many grains of sand does it take before you end up with the beach. And there was some like fancy word that nobody had heard of. And so you had to do it with psoriasis. That's what we came up with. (laughs) Psoriasis is paradigm or something. The psoriasis is paradox. That's what it is. I was going somewhere and I think I messaged Matt for some big ass words I could use while I was talking. (laughs) I think it's called like the riddle of the sand heap, something like that. It's a basically a thought experiment and kind of pokes fun a little bit at vagueness. We use very vague language. I've thought about doing an episode strictly on it just because that's how we end up talking a lot of the time and different circumstances kind of fall apart. So we like to joke around a little bit about the whole coffee maker and that I bought for at work. But in a way that kind of falls under that guise and that from a certain perspective, the rules may be one way, quote unquote rules. And from another perspective, they're not the same. So when are these lines Is there a really distinct line or where did the line kind of start and end and stuff like that? And I guess that would play well into what we're talking about is at some point spending diagnostic time or analyzing a problem, we kind of know what we're doing and collecting this data to arrive at a decision. But sometimes it's not the case. It's something we haven't seen before, be it a problem or a system or a car line or whatever. We spend time studying and I know everyone in This conversation, as as well as many that listen, there's a lot of the study time goes on at home off the clock. But when you're at the shop and you're looking up service information, where do you cross the line from actual diagnostic analysis time to I'm training myself to be able to apply some diagnostic analysis time? So I think that was kind of the nature of the idea of spinning off this. So yeah, the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast is available on, I think, pretty much all platforms. So go check that out. And he's got a lot of other okay episodes. I mean, I've been thinking about this all week because I work on body shop cars that are brand new. And recently, the newest one was 2023 Mazdas have a problem where the dashboard comes up and says, network error, please see dealer. And the guy who sends me a picture, hey, can you fix this? I'm like, oh, like, do you have any codes? Like, because he just sent me the picture. I'm like, I don't even know how to Google this picture in service information. And so he sends me this U3000 code. And I'm like, okay, so something's not talking. There happens to be a TSB on the problem. And all you got to do is update the TCU. But it was 15, 20 minutes of my reading time at night. I didn't charge the guy for it, right? Because I'm like, oh, you're going to figure out how to update a TCU, telematics control unit. and it's not hard to do. I had to like basically read a lot more and go into service information and go, oh, well, how do you download this file? Because TSB tells you like, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, done. And it fixes the problem. Thank God a TSB actually works. So I don't charge the guy for like 30, 40 minutes at home sitting through reading it and asking somebody's like, hey, you ever seen this? This is really going to fix it. 
but I surely charged them to program them. It happened to be a rental car company, so they have 42 of them they would like done. So I'm going to say the dealership that takes a month to get them a car back is now out 42 programs. And they don't take long to do, to my surprise, for a Telemax control unit. But as I went through that car and thought about it, I'm like, I think if it takes me more than 20 minutes, I'm bailing on the car and I'm going to go home and study the system. Now I'm mobile, so right, so my perspective's a little different. And then I thought about some more and I'm like, I'd probably say at, at 15 minutes, if I'm still reading, I'm just going to tell the guy I got to come back in a couple days because at 15 minutes of my time, I've now lost so much money that I'd rather come back in a couple days because obviously I don't know how the system works. And there's times when I break my 15 minute rule. I have a 2023 Jeep Grand Cherokee. It's the new one in an accident, broke the rack, got hit in the A pillar and when the rack broke, obviously the tire went wherever it wanted. So it slooped down into one of our nice ditches we have here. And the car thought it was going to roll. So it set the curtain airbags off. Of course, with curtain airbag deployment, cuts fuel. The reset for the fuel cuts, turn the key off, wait 30 seconds, start the car back up. It should start up. Car has never started since the accident. I bet you have six hours into reading this car. Now it's just like a vindictive point. This thing will run. And I got a bunch of people involved in it. And one of the guys goes, hey, did you know you have the wrong new airbag module in the car? Maybe that's why it doesn't run, even though you put a new one in it. And I'm like, what? I mean, I didn't even bother to check the part numbers because you think 23 ordered by VIN from the dealer, you'd get the right part. They sent a 22 model, which is different. So now tomorrow I'll find out if the new airbag module makes it start or not. Because they're like, oh, we got it today at four o'clock. We're going to put it in the first thing in the morning. Almost as a side note, I don't think I remember ever having this much trouble getting parts from dealers per VIN, per, you know, whatever RPO code, if you will, or calibration. My favorite is when they tell you it's the right part and you're like, do you want to come down here? Like the plug is not the same shape, bud. I can make this thing fit, but you will not like me after. (laughs) 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 We're not going to be friends anymore. My plug has 12 wires. This one has four. Which ones would you like me to fit in where? You just get it wedged up against something and get it vertical so you can stomp on it to get it together. That's all. That's what they want you to do, apparently. The part problem is huge right now, and it's causing us, I think, to have more of a learning curve than we've ever had. For sure. Yep. And I'm blaming this on COVID because that's why the Mercedes valve bodies are now a nightmare because we ran out of chips. And so they went to 27 different manufacturers. And now we have all these parts made by all these people and nobody can get them. The biggest one right now for me, problem wise, is GMs are shipped with parking sensors, but no parking control module. So it was in an accident. Now they're like, oh, my parking sensors don't work because they've had a rental for three months that the parking did work. And you're scanning it. There's no codes, no warnings on the dash, but it has no park. And you hit the button, nothing lights up. Then you see the TSB and you're like, oh, yeah, now I have the TSB like saved because I'm like, probably has no module. We went through that with the heated seats a couple times this past winter. Trailer brake control module was my latest one. It even shows gain on the dash, but there's no power at the plug. Yeah, and then they tell you it worked last year, and I'm like, dude, like I don't know what to tell you. Everybody's wrong sometimes. <laughs> Maybe some more Omega threes. Uh. I'm wrong like at least once an hour, it seems like. So it's possible that you're wrong about this one thing. <laughs> <laughs> if I ask your wife, you're wrong every minute of every day. Let's just be honest. 100% correct. My wife is nodding her head in agreement that I am wrong all the time. I actually tend to agree with you on this, Matthew. I, th- I think about like 20 minutes of reading is the max I'm going to do before I like have to go do something as far as... Okay, well, we're going to start testing something here. We're not going to read for an hour and a half. If I do decide that I absolutely have to read more, it's going to have to go out, and I'm probably going to do it at home at night in the silence away from the impact guns. That's the thing is you can't focus the same, at least I can't, on the job. Like I can read some stuff. I can figure it out. But if I really want to like get in-depth and focus and absorb something, i got to be at home away from the world of cars. Absolutely agree. That can be a little bit tricky because how do you bill for that? I mean, I don't know. I've never billed anybody for the 2000 hours of scanner danner I've watched. Like what's the difference, right? Reading the service info. And I don't know, I guess I'm a little nerdy. I fire up the computer once a week and just start reading service bulletins on new stuff or go on Oasis and see what they always have the list on Oasis or whatever, the new ones. And 
get ready for trying to not get my ass kicked when that problem comes through. And Oh, no. The worst is, you know, you read it and you can't remember where you read it and then you can't find it. And you're like, I'm pretty sure I read this somewhere. You know what I do is I read service bulletins and I'm positive there's a bulletin on it, but it's not even for a different vehicle made by that manufacturer. It's like I read a bulletin for a Ranger and I think it applies to this new Silverado or something <laughs> all mixed up in my head. But I guess it makes me at least search for them from the get go because I'm like, oh, I think everything I see, I always think there's a bulletin for it. And yeah, half the time there is. I don't know what the magic number is. Like, how do you pick a magic number? But for me, the magic number of reading. In the shop is going to be about 20 minutes, and the magic number that I'm going to go after that car without doing something else is going to be two hours. Oh, you're braver than I am. If I'm there an hour and I know the car is blue and it's broken, I'm leaving. All right, except my Jeep. My Jeep, I had a slow day. So, and my brother started with me. So, if you listen to Sean's podcast, you heard my brother. So, I thought taking my brother to the Jeep would be a good idea to teach him electrical. I think you wanted to like shoot me with my own gun after an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I just had this today. I was very well intentioned. We had a start stall on an older Malibu, like a 2010. I grab the young guy. I'm like, we're going to dig this together. I'm going to show him about checking for anti-theft stuff, this, that, and the other thing, blah, blah, blah. So I'm showing him it's got like the pass key three, you know, it's got the circle plus on the key and we're going through and I'm like, oh, that's weird. It's start stalling, but it's not saying fuel disable. So like I'm already derailed on what I thought it was going to be. And then... We fuel pressure test it, and it's not dying. I'm like, well, that's strange. So I look at the mass airflow, and that's okay. And I'm like, well, maybe we got something going on with a sensor somewhere, an input somewhere. So anyways, I take 15 minutes and just unplug one sensor at a time, and I found out the intake camshaft sensor, it's all irritated about that. And then I remember, like, from back in the day when we used to deal with this and the solution is to do the global reset where you touch the battery cables together, then take camshaft sensor itself doesn't have a problem. And I'm like, it kind of reminds me of your story, man. It's like how derailed from normal could this diagnostic get while you're trying to teach somebody? It's like stupid. Mine was just going to be like, Hey, this is a scope. I want you to see like this relay should have 12 volts coming out of it. The PCM should apply a ground. If there's no ground, because all the relays in this Jeep are built, are PCB relays, right? Except it takes two starter relays to start this car. And one's BCM ground controlled and one's power controlled from the PCM. Because it's got to start stop, right? Yeah. And I'm like, really? We need two freaking relays. And so now I have like 18 wires running so I can manually jump them because I have no command for either relay. And you have your scope out so you're already pissed off because you had to get your... Oh, no. I didn't even pull it out. When I realized I had two relays and no command, I bought him a Fluke 277A, the one with the screen that comes off. It eats batteries like we go through gloves. So buy some rechargeables, but love your life because that little thing is awesome to be able to take off. Is it like Bluetooth or something or wireless? Or I will tell you, it's got an IR thing in it. And so when you first turn the meter on, the screen has to be attached or it doesn't know to turn on. And if you don't put it back on when you turn it off, it won't give it the off command. I'm not telling you I might have wasted five batteries already. But I didn't even pull out the scope because I just wanted to show him a meter, right? Like, hey, there should be power coming to this relay line, and then the PCM is going to ground it. I'm like, well, we have no power. Well, where does he get power from? And I'm showing him how to chase a diagram that's not the best one to start a newbie off of, but whatever. We did it. And I'm like, oh, it comes from this BCM. Oh, where's the BCM? Oh, it's on the A pillar. Oh, well, let's go to that and let's probe that wire. And I'm like, oh, that's not even giving ground, but we have power. So let's activate that. Oh, now we have power over here. So I did. I had all these wires and little switches run. And I'm like, all right, let's jump everything together. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, my brother is in the worst diag physically possible. That's the thing is teaching on a live car. Yeah, it often does not go well. And I had the same thing when I was in the college with students like I want them to have some time on live cars. But a lot of the teaching part of it, you don't want on a live car. Just, yeah, I mean, OK, yeah, hey, it's real life. That's what's going to happen. But. I mean, that's exactly what we're talking about, right? Is having some focus time away to really learn this stuff is probably where you're going to pick up most of it then because you don't know what's coming at you with the car you're working on. No amount of reading and understanding wiring diagrams and reading service info is going to tell somebody that, oh yeah, I've been through this on a 2010 Malibu. The, it's not the actual intake cam sensor that's the problem. It's the PCM is annoyed for some reason. It needs a global reset. Like that's a prime example. Like how do you bill for getting there? Right. There's no logical line to get there. 
there's no line of logic other than in 2013, I had this happen. I scoped the cam sensor. I didn't trust my testing, even though I had a good signal. I put one in anyways, and the car was still freaking broke. And finally, while I was sobbing over the fender, I touched the battery cables together and the car started ran. You take six hours to fix the first one and then 30 minutes to fix the next three. And that's literally what this was. Yep. And you wash the money from the next five to make up that six hours. That's how that works. For me, I think a lot of it is just wrestling with kind of the ego of I should know. We're professionals and we're billing as professionals. So technically we should be service ready. I mean, for me, that definitely plays into an ego. You don't go to the doctor's office and they make you sit there for four hours why they do stuff pulls out the anatomy book right that's what i'm saying like fans was the first one to say well doctors do this and doctors do that well i had to go see a gi doctor and we we're talking and i had lots of questions i sat there and i'm going this guy's answering every one of my questions giving me super good detailed instructions about what the next steps are different procedures he wants to do different tasks right and i'm like i get it he's a specialist and that's all he does and he's charging that time to answer my questions. But at the same time, he's not looking this up. Like, he's not going back and going, well, let me read the description and operation of an esophagus here because I need to know as the GI doctor how this works. They have an advantage, though. They only work on two models. Give me the, just Chevy Silverados and F-150s, and I'll go through them each one time in my life, and I'll be done until the next generation of each model comes out. Looking around the shop today, I have a 1947 Ford Coupe. I don't even know the model with a flathead Ford and six volt positive ground. And a Walboro downdraft carburetor. Gen 2 Prius with a high volt battery pack out and apart in pieces. And I have like a 22 Nissan Sentra that Collision Shop had wanted me to calibrate radar. They didn't tell me that they replaced the radar. So now I ended up programming that today. So it's just this shotgun splatter pattern of vehicles that I have to work on. And most of them I'm fairly familiar with, but except that 47 Ford, but luckily there's not a whole lot to it. But sometimes it's hard to be ready for everything. And then it's like weighing that with, you know, I've got this vehicle I've never seen before with this problem I've never ran into before. And I've got to kind of figure out what I'm doing, whether that's description and operations or looking through the flow charts, not even to follow it step by step, but to just kind of go through. Sometimes there's nuggets of information. I know exactly what you mean with like with Fords, especially like every time I work on a Ford that's got a problem I haven't seen before. I'm not going to follow the pinpoint test, but you can bet your butt I'm going to scroll through it and see what it's looking for during the different steps. It's telling you what's involved to set that code. Yeah. I had a Facebook post about it. So maybe some people are familiar, but one idea is, and we didn't charge for this by any means, but that uh, 2001 Volkswagen Cabrio to add a key. Dealer told her to pound sand. So she brings it to us and being me say, uh, yeah, one way or another. And it's true, one way or another, I'm going to get it done. It just ended up being a bit of a debacle because it's just old enough and rare enough that nothing is pull on the pin DLC, at least that I know of. I don't have a few of the things to even try, so I didn't have Vague Taco to try. But I really doubt. Is that a real tool? <laughs> it is. It's a great tool if you have one. I know, right? Got to be careful with that. <laughs> he's, just, he's just making up names. If Sean would have been drinking something, he it out his nose on the screen it'd have been all over it'd have been epic even in stacy's automotive immobilizer book it says the only way to get the pin is e-proming so you got to get to the theft module open it up it's not hard chips very easy to get to read the chip i ended up doing it out of circuit okay so i pulled the hex data i have that and According to Stacy's book, a tool should have been able to convert that. Tango should have converted it, gave me the pin number. That didn't work. I thought VVDI2 would do it. It looked like it might, but it also failed epically. And after much dicking around and much conversations with Pedro De La Torre, it's all in AR Labs, the step-by-step, -step, how to do it yourself. So I've got hours invested in this, not just accessing that module, but also what am I going to do with this data now that I have it? And then once I had the pin number, pretty much any scan tool I had in the building was going to add the key. But I spent a lot of time trying to figure that out and just clone the chip on the key. That would have been great. You know, it ends up being unclonable. So it's really hard to charge this 
person hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars to add a key to her car. Yeah, especially on a 22-year-old Volkswagen. I give up too easy. I'd have gone on Auto Trader and just found her a used one with two. Yeah, it's cheaper for me to buy you a 10-year-old Volkswagen with two keys than it is to make you a key. Congratulations. Your new car. Listen, lady, I'm going to need your social security number and your last couple's pay stubs. We're going to take care of your key problem in a hurry. There's no problem. They make new German Hitler mobiles every single day. So there you sit. Like, I've got all this time invested. It was a great learning experience, but it was hard to do it on her dime. So that now the shops eat quite a bit. I'm eating it because I got time after work invested. I got phone calls with friends on the way to and from work on breaks, stuff like that. You get breaks? Wow. Even gets paid. You got breaks between every job. What are you talking about? I know, and I called you twice and you didn't answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Unfortunately, that car, it's hard to it'd be hard to make that up because there's probably not a Oh, one Cabrio or Eurovan. Yeah, that was the last ready one to come in. Probably. <laughs> that was probably it. That was the last one. You don't actually want to work on Eurovans, anyways. So let's be serious. Usually it's for like cruise control, and I just have to reflow solder joints in the cruise control module. Every Eurovan I work on has a camper attached oh, to it. Oh, yeah. Like rebuilt and stuff. There Africa. you go. Horrible. I don't even know what we're talking about anymore. A Volkswagen Eurovan? No. Nah. You don't know what that is? He's the luckiest man alive. Listen, we're in Florida. We got monies because we don't have snows. I fixed one for a guy who was the president of the Western New York Eurovan Club, and it was the worst thing I ever did. And then they started showing up, and I was like, yeah. I was like, we can't do these. Yeah, I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I had a Corvette club ask if I could come program a new 2023 Corvette because the guy got a unlocked module to tune and needed it programmed. I was like... Yeah, I can't do those. Sorry. <laughs> can't help me out because I'm like, oh, God. Once you start down the rabbit path of, oh, this guy can do things. like. But part of it's marketing a little bit. It's maintaining or further trying to grow that reputation of being that shop, the one that can get it done. And sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. When you got sprinter vans, I'm starting to think that's really bad. I don't know. Sprinters aren't that bad. I think sprinters are okay. I think Euro vans are far worse than sprinters. I think if it involves Germany, it should be outlawed in the United States and never allowed back in. Skiing, pools, cars, anything. I'm like ready to be on the fence about some of the German cars as far as servicing them. I mean, the only ones I'm really interested in servicing are the BMWs and the Icoms are on intergalactic back order right now. So it's like... Yeah, but... There's solutions for that. You can call and get an iScan 3 and it'll emulate an iCom and work just fine, right? I can go do 20 grand on a power stroke with my brain tied behind my back too. <laughs> like, like I don't know, man. I got to freaking think and do all this hard work. Freaking drop. Oh, another power stroke long block. Drop that off in the corner. I'll put that shit in, in the morning. I don't know. I have LMV. And so like, I just throw up the Justin Moore. Yeah, you bat- just call the liquor man. Yeah, I'm like, hey, little leprechaun, man, come tell me what I'm doing wrong. Matter of fact, I threw up my leprechaun symbol, and he didn't answer because he was in California training. Oh, gosh. And then he called me back, and I sent him all kinds of logs, and he's like, oh, that's a good one. I think the BDC took a dump. I'm like, it's a 23 BMW. I can go back to the dealer for a BDC. The rental car company gives me all kinds of weirdness because they're rental cars. So the sunroof was open. All the windows were down. No key would power this car on, but the remote worked. And no antenna read the key at all. Like, so the rental car company tows them, drags them, pushes them, Flintstones them. I don't know how they get them there, but they get them to the shop. And then the shop calls me because he's Mr. Fix-It. He's not really Mr. Fix-It. I'm Mr. Fix-It, but he gets all the credit. I don't care. pays my bills. And so he's like, hey, I ordered a key for this. Can you come program it? I'm like, dude, just hold it up to the antenna and push the start button. It'll earn the key because it's all you need to be MW. And he's like, oh, it still doesn't start. Come look at it. And so Justin's like, it's either got a padding antenna or it's got a shorted or a bad BDC. He goes, the front antenna is kind of common, but the only way to know is to unplug one antenna at a time. And I took a deep breath, sighed really hard. And I was like, I'll call the shop. And I called the shop. And they're like, oh, yeah, they towed it to the dealer because the windows are down and we can't like have it outside. And it's kind of in our way. And I'm like, yes, it's gone. It's so funny. I have such little faith in those cars to actually run. <laughs> Uh, last week or though you can hear them breaking in the park yeah i was thinking about that 
last week I was sitting on the tarmac at Chicago O'Hare airport and I was figuring out how much my Uber was going to be from Albuquerque to Santa Ana for this ETI tool tech thing. And the Uber ride was like $102 each way. And I'm like, okay, we're not doing that. And I got on at Albuquerque airport and I rented a car. They're like Toyota Camry. I'm like, no problem. Sounds good. So I get there. The guy's like, okay, well, and the guy's like, well, that's not how that works because you made your reservation late, blah, 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 blah. You can have either a Chrysler Pacifica, and I was like, ugh, or you can have a BMW 4 Series, and I was like, ugh. <laughs> there was no option three. Those are my two options. And I'm like, well, if I'm going to be stranded in the desert and bitten by a rattlesnake, at least I'll look kind of cool to the average person if I'm driving the BMW. <laughs> so I drove it, and then uh, I got there, and Seth Thorson walked in. I was like, oh, thank goodness you're here. He goes, what? I go, oh, they rented me this freaking piece of shit. I go, I feel like I have a chance at making it out of here if you're here. Oh my gosh, it was horrible. I'm walking over to this other part. I'm always looking to see if there's like a puddle of oil under it or anything. You know, I'm like, I'm gonna have to freaking walk my ass back to the airport. <laughs> this freaking car, I have no faith in this thing. We have the complete opposite ideas of renting a car. I'm like, I'm gonna take the cars that are so unreliable so I can see how many I can go through in a weekend. I don't travel that well. Like, I just wanted to get from the airport to the place and not go anywhere for four days. So it was perfect for that. I didn't have to leave. We were going on an anniversary trip in California and it was LAX or something. And they have this high faluti rental car place, right? Cause it's the liberal nut job, California. And so I was picking out the car to like Jaguar, like some sporty two door car. Right. And I'm like, it's only like five dollars more than the Camry sold to me. Yeah, that was my deal. They're like, oh, with my discount, it's only five dollars more. I'm like, what's the freaking tow bill gonna be? I'm like the most unreliable car on the planet, and I'm gonna take my wife up a mountain with it and go to this lodge and go camping for three days. Yes, Jaguar. Where there's bears. No, but there was wolves. Oh my gosh. I thought they were dogs, and the guy's like, Don't go near those. They kill people. And I'm like, What? And he's like, That's not a dog, dude. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> For 98 years, the Napa name has meant quality parts and service. It also reflects top quality training programs to help you build a more successful vehicle repair business. No doubt, the technician shortage is impacting everyone, but you're not facing this battle alone. Napa has the solution by making Napa Auto Tech training available near you. Napa Auto Tech provides automotive aftermarket technicians career development opportunities through structured, disciplined, measured, and high-quality technical instruction, no matter the technician or service advisor skill level. This instruction enhances understanding of vehicle systems, increases first-time repair capability, and overall customer satisfaction. It also prepares technicians to become ASE certified. It's a fact technicians who receive training to improve their knowledge and skills have a higher sense of job satisfaction. This reduces technician turnover and increases productivity, directly improving a shop's profitability. It is vital to the success of a shop's business that today's technicians are equipped to diagnose and repair today's complex vehicles. With our ever-changing technology, the technician's knowledge and skills need to be updated and refreshed on a regular basis. As you labor over the decision of whether to send your techs to get their skills sharpened, keep in mind, Napa Auto Tech Training is an investment, not an expense, and it's available to all. Much of Napa Auto Tech's training is offered in more than one format to accommodate varieties of learning styles and training preferences so each person can maximize their learning. Whether you're more of a hands-on person or enjoy learning at your own pace, Napa Auto Tech is here to provide you with the training you need in the format that works best for you. To learn more about what Napa Auto Tech offers, contact NapaAutoTech.com. The medical reference was, from my wife's perspective, we're, we're getting the opposite of doctors answering questions and having answers. And I'm not saying they're sitting there looking it up while you're sitting in the office with them, but we're getting charged a lot of money for no answers. And I would like to believe they're looking into it at some point in time, whether I guess it's their time or however that works out. But I do wonder just strictly for our world is it reasonable to charge for some research depending on the issue? I mean, I'm sure we start tweaking parameters and stuff like that where the car has been tampered with somehow or. Oh yeah, for sure. If it's got a tune gone out the door instantly, I don't even care. Take it to John Doe down the street who likes to work on tuned BS. Right. We w- we probably wouldn't really hesitate for kind of sticking, not sticking it to him, but at least charging them for all of that time looking into it. 
part of it that makes it really difficult to like quantify something like that, like here's what you charge, is it's going to be wildly different depending on who is doing the work, right? Just experience level for one, you know, a newer person versus some experience, but just there's different levels of intelligence. Like the three of you probably are going to figure out how the system works faster than me. So I'm going to be sitting there longer. Do I get the bill for more? Doubt it. Remember, I'm the one just trying to change the diesel engines. But that was my argument with Paul Danner when him and I had this, is if we're charging for every second I'm spending on this car, I'm never going to Vision. I'm never going to ASTE. You're never going to see me in a training class because I'm just going to charge the shit out of that customer at $180 an hour to sit there and read a book. And every car is getting billed 12 hours and I'm working on one car a day and I don't care. Right. Because at what point, and I get it, that's an extreme and it's absolutely asinine. Right. I get it. But that's where this is going to go. And you can't say, no, it's not because that's what happens. Right. You give an inch, you take a mile. It's, it's happened in every industry across the board. So at what point is too far? Well, I just kind of told myself 20 minutes and I've stuck with it. But I very much think that if we're going to go that route, you're right. I'm never going to vision and I'm never going to another training event. But I also think your point of intelligence is a good one. So if you gave Justin Morgan and I each a M2 competition BMW and says, hey, it runs bad. Justin is going to figure it out in 20 minutes. I'm going to sit there and finagle for three hours reading through a lot of these BMW systems. I would say if we got paid, you know, let's say there's two lines, it was two hours of Diag and it took me four. That's fine. Why? Because I spent probably the other two hours reading to death. I'd have just moved the ignition coils, man. That's what I'm saying. Like, I get that experience pays off. And that's why the longer you've been in the industry, it seems the more you get paid because the shop kind of expects you to know a lot more than the guy that just walked in the door at a tech school. I agree with that 100%. I think one of the references though, or comparisons was is like to attorneys, lawyers. And how does that work where you have an attorney that has a lot of experience in tax law or something and another one that doesn't, but they either one would take your case. The one with a lot of experience, they're probably not looking much up. They probably know it off the, off the cuff where the other one's got to spend time looking into it. And I think you get charged for some of that, if not all. I don't know, but I think that was one of the comparisons brought up or analogies. We're dealing with an estate lawyer for my father-in-law's estate, right? I forget what he charged. It was like 40 bucks to send an email saying, hey, we're ready to close the estate when you do this, this, and this. And the email probably took five minutes, but it was like a $40 charge. And my wife just laughed. Like, really? You said it was a $40 bill? It took you longer to write the freaking bill than it did the email. It almost makes you wonder if this whole conversation has a lot to do with automotive repair being pushed into a commodity versus a necessity. And like, so if we take and we compare, if we take the doctors and lawyers out of it and we go to another transportation service industry, aviation, which I have experience in talking about because my wife is a aviation mechanic, it's vastly different how they view this. They are to do things by the book. When she's going through and she's doing a job she's done before, she has the manual out and she's reading what torque. They literally look everything up. Everything is looked up every time. Every helicopter, every time she works on the same helicopter, she has the same manual out looking at the torque specs for the pedal linkage for the co-pilot on the same thing that she swapped out two days ago and swapped back in. So... I guess there's such like a shifting expectation. Is it it because they're cars? I mean, she's certainly a professional at what she does. She has to be licensed and certified and pass a practical exam hands-on that's been proctored by a government official. It's a professional service and repair thing, right? Like that's the deal. And I was shocked at what they get paid to do and how fast or mainly lack thereof with the speed they have to do it with. I think I might have really missed my calling in this whole thing. It seems like more my sloppy type speed. It's like, wait a second, you're going to take the whole day to do 45 minutes worth of work? I shouldn't say that. That's not true. But it's a whole different deal. It's very interesting when I talk to her to listen to the differences between her workday and my workday. But let's talk about differences, right? Like, if you leave a wheel loose, the car's going to crash into a side of the road. This is no big deal. They're just flying over water. It ain't no big deal. 
The thing's got floaties on it. I seen them. Or she leaves a helicopter blade loose and it flies through the shop and chops off Hanslow's head. I mean, you know, there's just like vastly different. I've heard similar things from like the railroad industry, though. I knew some techs that worked at Firestone that went to work for the railroad and they're like, we do a quarter of the like volume of work that we do here at Firestone and we get paid more and pension and all this other stuff, too. So I I don't know enough about the railroad to know exactly why that is. But I I, just to your point, Brian, there are other industries to kind of compare to that do it differently. Yeah, they're definitely spending more time reading that information. I'm cool with the expectation that we can't get paid to read every last bit of information there's out there. It just intrigues me that for some reason, independent aftermarket or dealer for that matter, auto repair, it's different than just about every other transportation industry even like not even jump into lawyer or doctor. Cause we do that. And I think that's pretty, and I'm not saying that the lawyer and the doctor aren't very comparable because to work on everything, you're going to have to be pretty smart and you're going to have to be read up like many lawyers and doctors are. I just think that it's interesting that when we compare it to any other transportation industry, we're still the odd ones out, right? It's easy to say, well, you're the odd one out kind of because you know, you're comparing it to doctor and lawyer, but we're still the odd ones out. That's the expectation. But let's talk about why, right? Like, if I want to do an annual maintenance on my airplane, I can do it. But I have to have an FAA certified person come over and inspect I did it right. Okay, Joe Blow down the street can go buy an engine, transmission, brakes, suspension. Nobody inspects that car and he can put it together. So when you take out the government entity that that overlies the safety and the other aspects of it, you're talking vastly different things now. That was the first place my mind went. And then I thought about Michigan and Canada. They're just as after as the rest of us. So it's <laughs> the government entity stepping in, in the automobile. Michigan's weird. To professionally work on a car, you have to pass their test. Nothing says that Joe Blow can't work on his own car or the neighbor's car. You just can't make a living doing it. There was a guy crop dusting earlier here with an airplane. I wonder if he's had an annual inspection ever. I wonder if like the same thing happens with airplanes. I see what you're saying, though. Like I know exactly what you mean. If I had an airplane here, I, sure, I could go do the work on it. But if it leaves the ground without the paperwork, I could go to jail. Where with a car, that's not the situation. Yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying there. Now, I think a more comparable thing would be jumping industries, plumber, electrician, carpenter, right? Like if I hired an electrician to come in and wire my house and I saw electrical for dummies and he's learning how to do a breaker panel right there, I'd be like, but that works too easy. You can touch black, you can touch white, you can't touch them at the same time and you can't touch them together. That's all you have to know. That's the end of it. There's nothing else to know. And I've got some friends that are electricians, but like it's not on the technical end. It's honestly just not comparable. No, I agree. But you don't see them reading how to use a multimeter. You don't see them reading. And there's different, like you get into commercial with three phases or wiring other things. Like it gets a little weird. Like you get into like four way switches. It gets a little weird. And then you get the oddball stuff where, you know, you only have one power circuit that powers a whole room and it's on this GFI and blah, blah, blah. Right. Like there's some oddities that make the job a little interesting, but you don't see a guy sitting there reading it. You don't see the guy bending the conduit, which I don't know if you've ever bent conduit, but holy fuck, is that a skill? Like, oh, I need to make this S curve to go around this wall. And the guy's like, ding, 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 four measurements. So he's all over there by hand. Turn, turn, turn. Oh, yep, it fit. I'm like, geez, right? But when they bid a job, it's, oh, yep, we're going to come in. We'll wire your shop. It's 18000 bucks. Take it or leave it, right? If they go through 40 pieces of extra pipe because that guy sucked at bending pipe that day, they don't come back to the shop owner and go, well, you know, we had this amateur guy out there and we had to teach him how to bend pipe at your cost. That went up 300 bucks, bud, right? That doesn't happen. They just take it on the chin and they move on. That kid learned how to bend pipe that day because he screwed up $600 worth of pipe. And that's just the way it is. Like. You cut a board wrong on a, you know, you cut a two by 12 wrong as you're making a flight of stairs. You don't get to redo it. Just go out, buy another $200 piece of lumber because it's now past COVID and life goes on. Why in the automotive industry all of a sudden do we get to charge because we want to sit there and read for four hours or we want to scope test everything under the sun? Because, oh my gosh, if I see one more post, I got this no start. Uh, well, let's see your scope captures of the following 12 sensors. Guys are going in cylinder for a freaking mass airflow sensor code. Oh, my gosh. Are you sure the cat's not plugged? You got an in cylinder of it? <laughs> if I could navigate to the Grand Island Bridge, I would jump off it. 
and I think maybe some shops that happens at if if at our shop if somebody underqualified touches a car and it turns into costing extra money like we usually we take that on the chin. I almost said usually it's not usually like we always right if it's the guy you know nobody pays three hours to get something diagnosed that I could have diagnosed in an hour. And I think this whole conversation started because Paul Danner posted some like video that he's like, oh yeah, we spent like four hours on this. Should we charge for it? Yes, we should. And I was like, no, no, you shouldn't. One, you're filming. I know that's adding time. Two, like you're filming. And three, like, I don't think that time's all reasonable to charge for that problem. And when him and I talked about it, on the phone, he's like, oh, yeah, I probably could have done it in an hour versus four hours if I wasn't filming and explaining to the camera. I'm like, exactly. How can you then say into a camera, oh, you should, I should charge it four hours. Filming a diagnostic is extremely difficult. It is. I don't know how he does it. Like, I did a couple videos, and I'm like, I'm going to shoot myself. I have to explain how it really works for the hundredth time. I'm like, how did this video become 40 minutes long after it's edited? And it's like, it's like the simplest diag on earth. I did not realize how much I think. So what I did for my brother for the last two weeks is he's just following me in his work vehicle. So I'm getting like zero miles per gallon now because we have two drops. <laughs> yeah. I did that for a few weeks. And God, is it expensive? But what I'm doing is, is the first job. I'm like, let me explain to you what I'm doing. So every thought that went through my head, I said it out loud. And after 10 minutes, my brother's like, you think entirely too much. So I did the same thing, Matt. The first week I had my employee, uh, same thing, follow me around and I'm just going to explain everything I'm doing. And that was the week I caught laryngitis. So I'm like trying to talk like this. Like it normally I'm in the van by myself. I'll say like, hello, what's your problem? And I don't talk to anybody like all week. And the week I got to talk to my employee, I can barely get a word out because my throat's just screwed. Yeah, I don't do a great job at vocalizing what I'm doing which is why some of my diagnostic videos are so boring because I look at something and when it doesn't turn out as expected, I go, huh, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, I'm like, wait a second. That's not supposed to be like that. Like on a couple of the things that I've worked on that I filmed where I've got two hours in raw footage, like those, those people didn't pay two hours for that diagnostic work, right? It was paid an hour or the standard diagnostic charge, you know, because filming definitely takes longer. 100% agree. It's just really perplexing when I look at this and I look at other industries. There's so many industries, whether it's transportation, whether it's a professional, you know, white collar type deal, whether it's in other skilled trade that are just doing this so different, I guess. How do you even set the standard of what we're supposed to be doing? How everybody's doing it different. It sounds like, you know, after we talk it out, it's like, I guess we have to do our own thing. You got shops that the second the car comes in the bay, they're just like, oh, we're running a clock on it. You get an hour, an hour, we'll call the customer, get another hour. They don't even go an hour. They go 45 minutes. In 45 minutes, you better let me know what you want to do next. You know, that happens at places, which is, I guess it's okay if you want to run like that. I prefer to not really pay attention to the clock while I'm doing it. And, you know, everything pretty much works out okay. I'm bad about keeping time when I'm in it. But when it comes to one of those cars where you spend a ton of time on it, whether it be researching or fighting through it, I guess the way I try to look at it on like an individual basis is that it's an investment. Like you're taking some of your time now and you, maybe you're not going to get paid for it or paid as much as you, you maybe think you should at the moment, but you're going to make up for it down the road, right? You're going to get the interest later, just like investing money. You know, it's a pain right now to set aside whatever percent of my income, but then you invest and you get the big returns later. I think that's kind of the, the mindset that helps me when I'm three hours into something and I got a ton of other stuff to do and I'm not going to be, I'm not going to bill three hours for this particular job because I wasn't up to snuff on what I'm doing. Right. That's at a individual level. I don't know if it's different from a shop ownership perspective. I don't know if they see it that same way as you spending three hours on that. I don't know if you guys can tell me. We can't get shops to send people to training. Come on. Any big event we've gone to, it's the same 200 geniuses that show up right like i can pretty much tell you that at vision tell you 200 people that are going to be there beyond a shadow of a doubt aste i can tell you 100 people are going to be there it's the same people that show up over and over and over again and you got shops going oh i can't get anybody to fix this car well yeah no shit you can't get anybody to fix this car four people for per state are showing up to the event unfortunately it's absolutely true and i think the other thing is you know there's there's a lot of sharp people that 
don't go to these things, but it's still, even if with the number of people out there working, it's still a minute percent of people that are actually trained up to what I would consider a minimal level to do this type of work, you know? To do it on the independent side. And I don't know, maybe some of this is an argument for specialization within our own field, you know? Not that you wouldn't have to study, not that you wouldn't still have challenges, but your focus is going to be a little bit more narrowed and you'll be ready for more of what you see every day. That's been our question. Do we cut our car lines? Do we cut the makes down that we're working on? There's a lot of logic to the specialization, whether it's reduced car lines, if you're going to keep everyone for the most part, most of your techs bumper to bumper, then it's really logical to start reducing car lines. If you're going to have you know, kind of like us, I guess, our shop all makes all models, then the techs kind of start specialized in certain systems or areas of repair. But it just seems to me it's the only reasonable way to remain fairly competent on multiple car lines is remain a little more focused on certain systems or areas of repair. I don't think I could do what I do across, not that I do it really well, but across virtually all car lines, if I also had to pull in vehicles and do brake jobs and oil changes and tires and timing chains. Those are called mental health moments. I don't think I could be Brian Pollock. No, I couldn't beat him. You're kind of that guy, though. You're the bumper to bumper to guy. There really isn't much you don't do. I miss doing tires. There's nothing better when them guys haven't been doing their job and you can crank your old ass off a car and get over there and slap four tires on in like 16 minutes. And they're like, what the hell just happened? That refrigerator just put all them hoops on in like 15 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) It doesn't help. You don't need a tire machine. You're just like, I absolutely do cram the first beat on barehanded. I do not use the tire machine to put a beat on. I just slam it on there. I bet the guys were trying to use the tire machine for some 19.5s or something a couple weeks ago. And I said, you guys are doing this all wrong. It takes a while to do them on a tire machine because, you know, it's only like a horse and a half turntable and all this crap. And they're like load range H tires or something. And I'm like, guaranteed one minute. I, I go, give me those bars one minute. I did it in like 59 seconds. I could still hang on the truck tire. Take one off and put one back on one minute. That took a while to learn how to do on a semi truck tire. But man, once you get it, you can fly. So when we first opened, we used to do service for some trucking companies that had triaxle dump trucks. And we would do two, four pops after five o'clock and I would still leave by six. Yeah. And it was Jim and I, it was just him and I at the time. And he'd be rolling tires around and jacking axles up and I'd be flopping. Yeah, but when you can carry one 19 and a half inch of Koa rim and tire, you can't, you know? I mean, it's easier to learn on the big ones. You learn on the 24 fives and you can like transfer that down to the smaller ones. You might have to use two hands to pick up the 24s. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) I was getting my butt kicked by one friend of mine sends one of his techs over and his tech, his name was Foxy. He was probably 70 something and a little guy, right? And oh my God, he made it look so easy. It was so fast. It, it took a few, but I got it down for a while. It's all about where you put the bar and knowing what to do with the bar once you've right? The way you you swing, you want to get the bar out, you have to swing it in the direction in which you're working around the bead. And uh, there's, there's a bunch of stuff that our younger guys don't pick up on either. So we get their ass kicked for like eight minutes trying to get one bead off. And I go over there and take it off in two seconds. And I hand them the bars back and go try again. The difference is though, like when I started doing tires, low pros had just come out. And so none of the machines had the arm assist. Oh, sure. They had like five tire irons. You just... Yeah, yeah. So like you were over there with two arms kind of leaning with your armpit and the third one and going, ah, it's on. And so the other day I was at a shop and they were they were like, oh, boss, we really need this new tire machine. You know, it's got like three extra arms on it. And it was a low pro. And I was like, you guys know I'm the program guy, right? And I'm like, you got, you got another one of those bars? And I was like, yeah, we got like three of them. I'm like, just move. And I put the tire on by myself. And I kid you not, all the techs were like, holy shit, the program guy can do something besides push a button. <laughs> I'm like, I've probably done thousands of these. Like, I don't know, man. I like getting away from dying if I get a chance to put a timing chain on or put an engine in. Or I do too. I just don't want it to be tires. Because here's the thing, right? Like at any shop I go to, they always have a set of tires that nobody wants to mount. So if I get a car that's like really kicking my butt and I just want to think, I'm like, hey, who's mounting them tires? Can I do them tires for you while I'm here? 
<laughs> and all the shops are like, what? It's like, just let me do the tires. I'll handle the tires. I did some pads and rotors on a Jeep today. It was amazing. It's like being on vacation. <laughs> like, this is so easy. My mental brakes are generally keys and ADOS. Those are my mental brakes from Diag. All my ADOS turns into crap recently. So now I'm like, oh God, it's not even a mental break anymore. Yeah, putting an engine in sounds way easier, actually. <laughs> That's not much of a mental break, keys and ADOS. That seems like it'd be a little tedious after a while, nonstop. In my mind, for the brick and mortars position, if you've got a tech that's pretty competent on doing that stuff, or you're willing to invest in someone, you think like they have that it factor, because that's the only thing I can think of to, to describe it as that it factor that sometimes we maybe take for granted our willingness to spend so much of our own personal time learning, getting better paying our own way to go to training classes or training events and networking and befriending people and joining groups on social media and whatever, that if you've got one of those techs that you're willing to take some of those hits to develop them into the next Brian Pollock, the next Sean Tipping, the next Matthew Scundridge. And then after that, if they're investing whatever time, maybe you're not charging it all to the client, but you're taking that on as part of I mean, I got to believe training in mind and almost marketing. It's furthering that reputation of not only the clients can send stuff to you to help, but other shops. We do have other shops that do reach out. I just had a guy today message me shop from in the area about an issue that he's having with something. So there is definitely a marketing aspect of being able to just do anything that you feel like doing, right? Like that's our limitation really is you know, do we feel like getting involved? A lot of it's reading the customer. We just had a customer with a Cadillac, I don't know, a newer, not a CTS, XTS maybe. It had a locked up front strut and I like, I don't know. We just like, as simple as putting a strut in is, like we just were like, you know what? I don't know if this lady's like the right fit for us, you know? So a lot of it comes down to what do you actually want to do? And some of that comes down to customer level. Like, this will never be worthwhile doing what we're going to do. She came in complaining that the reason her car rides like crap is because the other shop didn't put heavy-duty shocks in the back when she asked for them and everything else. And it's like, I don't know. So there's definitely a marketing advantage, though, to being able to do anything that you desire to do on a car. I can kind of hear the management gurus kind of barking, saying, like, well, the opportunity costs. That bay... You're messing around for three hours to figure out this misfire or whatever. It doesn't even matter what it is. Could have had two, three brake jobs that you made a killing on. And yet, I'm just for us, and maybe Riverside's a bad example. I don't know. But if I make out a printout of our top 50, top 20, top 25 clients and looking at how they got started with us, a lot of them, it was a check engine light they had bounced around shop to shop or a electrical issue or a programming issue that the other shops couldn't do. And that's why they're here. So then there's that opportunity. All of cost. our first time diesel customers get their drivability or after treatment issue fixed. And they also get their ball joints and their brakes and their gallopers or whatever else they need. And that's been Jim and I have been talking about that for a long time. Nobody wants to have to have a diag shop and nobody wants to have a guy for this. And it's kind of like why we're thinking about like maybe cutting the manufacturers a little, like maybe a little bit more specialization. But it's like, you know, if dad drives a Ford and mom drives a Chevy and they bought the kid a Kia, like, do they really want to have to take whatever car line you're going to not? And Kia is not a good example because we'll, we'll still work on Kia. And the shops that claim they're one-stop shops, what do they do? They got a mobile guy on speed dial that they pray can solve the cars they can't. And the mobile guys are only so good. Like, I'm good at diagnosing cars. It comes to some of these, like, internal engine issues. And I'm like, yeah, it's got a problem in the engine. Well, how do you know? Uh, compression's low. Well, well, can you tell me if it's a ch No, I don't give a crap, man. Compression's low. Put a motor in it. See you. Bye. Like, it's internal. That's not my problem. It's not electrical. I don't care anymore. Right? Well, it doesn't matter because it's the right answer anyhow. For the most part, yeah. I just had one the other day, a 19 Ram 5500, a refrigerated box truck with a Hemi because they bought one with a gas because they're sick of paying for diesel after treatment repairs. So they're paying for engines now. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Instead of a couple grand on diesel after treatment repairs, now it needs a 
$13,000 Hemi job. And it's like, they're like, well, what's wrong in there? I'm like, it's broke. Well, can't you take it apart and fix it? I said, nope. <laughs> I can break you a long block. Like, I don't care to fix your 113,000 mile 2019 Hemi that Dodge couldn't get put together. Like, what am I going to do with it? And back to the whole like marketing thing, right? I didn't have dinner with the guy, but he's a friend of mine from church. I met this guy. He owned seven, eight businesses, multi, multi millionaire. We met at church and I always knew he, he had money, but he never flaunted it, right? Like drove like older, simple cars. And then one day I realized he had money when his wife was like, hey, would you go with me to the BMW dealer and just drive my other car back that finally came in because I can't like go up there and come back, but I really want to pick it up. And I'm like, sure. And it was a brand new Z4, like the day they had come out, like was delivered at the dealer. I'm like, oh, they must have more money than I thought. But I was talking to him tonight and I asked, she still has a Z4. It's like a 20... 10 2009 she still has it says it doesn't even have thirty thousand miles on it so <laughs> it's in like primo condition but we were talking and i was asking him about having employees and his tricks because he had at one point a boatload of employees for seven businesses and he goes you know the best thing you can do with an employee i said what's that he goes treat them like family everybody's gonna make mistakes everybody's gonna break stuff but you treat them like your kids you talk to them in a nice manner hey what happened how this happened what we learn how can you not do this again You know, or did they do the job as efficient as they could have? No. Well, let's talk about it. Why didn't you do it efficient? What can we do to help you be efficient? He's like, and that's how you grow. And as you grow them and you keep them and you take them to the next level, the next level, the next level, they're never going to leave because they realize that by leaving one, he goes, you're going to have to pay him well. Two, you've treated them with respect the whole time. Three, you helped them grow a career in your business. So now they depend on you to pay them. You depend on them to help pay themselves basically he goes you end up with a business that's self-sustaining and you don't have to be there and i think in this industry when we're talking about a tech shortage that's what we need to have happen we need to be able to make mistakes and not worry about it coming out of our pocket if i hear one more person in asa going can i charge my tech because he broke x y and z i'm going to strangle him through the freaking internet i was at a body shop and the manager a kid drove a car into the one of them super tall like ford transits like i have he didn't realize the door wasn't up enough and clipped the top of the roof. The manager's like, you have to pay for that. I pulled the manager aside. And I'm like, dude, that's against the law. He cannot pay for that. I understand it sucks to eat it, but that's the way it is. Either you fire him and you do it yourself or you pay him to fix it. It's the way it works. Got to set the example. And I'm like, that's not setting the example for the next generation. Like, what are you doing? And him and I, we went to lunch and, and hashed it out. And at the end of lunch, you know, it was funny. He come back and he told me, he's like, you know what? He's, or no, the next day I was back at the shop, which I was kind of surprised because I jumped and shit. But I was back at the shop. The manager goes, hey, you know what I did after lunch? He's like, what? I said, he goes, I went over, pulled all the texts together and said, hey, you know what? I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have said you were paying for that. I am going to ask you to help fix it. And we're probably not going to pay you the full amount of hours we'd normally pay for that job, right? Because they, it's a body shop. Some of their hours are just ridiculous. But he's like, we'll make sure it's all taken care of and da, da, da. Because he's like, you're right. The next generation ain't. They're not coming into this field. We got to start acting a little different than we used to. But the guy's an older gentleman. Back in the day, guarantee you that car was getting fixed for free and the tech was buying the new roof. But I'm like, we can't do that anymore. You can't say we're a professional industry and treat people like crap. It's ridiculous. I've seen it many times and I've said that would be, you can tell your tech you're going to make them pay for it. I said, if you told me I was going to have to pay for a mistake, I'd just lock my shit up and roll it out. And they're like, well, you're some sort of, you, I mean, you've seen the comments, man. I'm like, you can say whatever you want. I don't need you to fix the car. <laughs> like you say whatever you want about, I don't need you. I would freaking absolutely lock my shit up. I wouldn't even go home. I'd just be on the phone. I'd just go through my inbox and see which offer I like the best. And I'd call the tow truck and have it dragged over there. I go, I, well, what are these guys thinking? They're out of their minds. I'd go home and play Xbox for a day and then call people the next day to come get my box. Maybe I'd play my Nintendo Switch, I guess. I remember I was working at a Dodge dealer and I was the only one who was very, very good at electrical, which kind of surprised me because the guy who had been there for 34 years absolutely sucked at electrical. And him and I became friends because anytime he got the heavy electrical job that I was not qualified to do, he'd just slide it over into my bay and he'd hang some brakes and be like, oh, Matt's still working. Got to give him another brake job, right? Because he was getting paid for me. So we would trade out and that's how I made my money. 
Well, I ended up doing an opinion seal, rotate and balance on this truck with like, it was 2007. I still remember 2007 Dodge Ram 1500 with a Hemi and it had 26 inch rims. Well, I did all this work and like five days later, it comes back in on a tow truck. One of the wheels is missing. Fenders all tore up, all kinds of stuff. And the boss is like, oh, you left the wheels loose. I'm like, there's no way. Like I torque every wheel by hand. There's no way. Well, I go to unlock the truck to pull it in. And I noticed the door lock doesn't work in the driver's side. Handle doesn't work on the outside. Handle doesn't work on the inside. Hmm, that's suspicious. I now notice that I'm on the passenger side of the truck. Half the lug nuts are missing off all the wheels. And I thought to myself, this is really odd. And the passenger side happened to open. And then it dawned on me. Somebody was stealing the guy's 26 inch rims. Jimmy, the door open, broke everything inside because all the little plastic rod locks that go over, all of them were broken. We had to get everything in the door panel. And I was like, I'm not paying for this. I think somebody stole the rims. Like, I saw my fault. Like, how did just half the lug nuts fall off? Right? Like, it doesn't make any sense. And the manager's like, you're paying for it or you don't have a job. I was like, okay, no problem. I literally walked over, locked my toolbox and went home. I was like, I don't care. I ain't paying for it. It was like 1500 bucks, And I was 19 years old. I'm like, I'm not spending it. Three paychecks on that. Like, get the frick out of here. The whole notion's ridiculous that I can't even deal with them people. If somebody was around me and said that to my face, I would probably get like pretty violent, actually. <laughs> like, I would be really irritated. What if you're on flat rate, you screw something up, then you've got to fix it without getting paid the second time? I mean, I- that happened to me plenty of times, and I was okay. I will with hop it. on my skag and I will go mow grass for a living before I go to work and not get paid in this godforsaken industry. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. What? I don't even want to get into the flat rate debate and everything that's wrong with that. I think my whole point was just Matt's marketing thing, right? Like, forget the customer marketing. Right. We're not talking about customers marketing anymore. Now you're talking tech marketing. And when everybody in ASOG is going, I can't find a tech, I can't find a tech, I can't find a tech. If that tech gets to come over and go, hey, guess what? My boss let me spend two hours. I learned a shit ton on this car and I fixed it. And he didn't complain that I spent two, five hours. on Let's make it something insane, right? Hey, I spent five hours on this car. Boss paid me my five hours I was on it because I fixed it and I was right. But I got paid my five hours and the boss charged a customer two and said, hey, glad you learned something. Next time, we're going to knock it out of the park. Guess what? That shop's going to have tax. That shop's going to have tax. Yeah, you can't beat up on your guys. That's for sure. A, it's not really acceptable. And I think it's one of those things in this industry. The people that we worked for were beat up on. So we got beat up on. I'm not going to continue with the toxicity. I'm not going to do it. Even Sean's example. I remember one of my biggest mistakes. I was a timing belt on a car and my boss had a rule where you take timing belts and hold them together to make sure you got the right one because some of the motors had like, it was his rule, right? So I got the timing belt off. It was lunchtime. And I said, hey man, it's lunch because he was very picky about going at the correct time. So I said, hey, it's lunch. Can you make sure the pulleys, he wanted to check the pulley sizes and everything. So just verify all that for me. He said, yeah. He put everything in my box, on top of my box, my little craftsman toolbox, right? The little shelf. That's what I worked on. The new timing belt fell off my box and on the ground, and I didn't see it. So I came back after lunch, put everything on, had the car started, and this was like, there's a bay, and there's a bay behind me. And so I had to like wait, and then I drove the car up on the bay. It's warming up. I'm cleaning up all the oil because, you know, it's timing belt. You did water pump and everything when you're in there. It's warming up. I go to throw all the old stuff away, and I pick up the timing belt, and I was like, holy crap, man. Spell says 120,000 miles on it. It looks brand new. And he, it's like four o'clock. Like customer is coming to pick up this car. And I asked the boss, I said, hey, what do you think the chances are that the belt looks this good? And so then I quickly took off the top cover and realized I'd put the old belt back on. I mean, it was three and a half hours. I stayed late that night, put the new belt on. And you know what? The boss called me or when I came in the next day at eight o'clock, he goes, hey, what time did you leave? And I was like, I don't know, probably 10 o'clock, man. I went, had dinner, came back, unlocked the alarm. He's like, okay. So if I pay you five hours, we'll call it even. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, everybody makes mistakes. I stayed there for a long time. And then finally I left because, you know, the shop got slow and I had, I had really good opportunities and he's like, no, you need to leave. But I mean, I stayed there because he, he treated me right. Did I make top dollar there? No. But if I made a mistake, I could go tell him like, Hey, we did some stuff where you needed special pullers, broke a timing gear. It was an $1,800 mistake. And he's like, Oh, I told you to do it. We didn't have the tool. I took the risk. We'll order that timing gear. No problem. And I'm like, that's 18. You're not even make, like, you're so negative in the hole this week now, just from that job. Plus paying me the labor. Like, I don't understand. But he's like, hey, risk and reward. That's how this 
Here he is. It all works out in the end. We have a fair amount of broken stuff and a fair amount of mistakes. And it, I don't think anybody out there is operating perfect as much as they'd like to. Well, evidently, you don't read forums very much because there's lots of shops that run. Oh, yeah. I'm sure they're running real perfect. So there's a lot of techs that don't make any mistakes. They diagnose everything. And I mean, I don't know. It must be 10. Yeah, it's like two tens. Double digits are for rookies, man. You go into 12 minutes, your rookie status. I'm still hoping to break 50 grand a year for a salary. Y'all are killing it over here. <laughs> I, I spend it all. I got new power strokes and golf carts. That's stupid. <laughs> See, I don't even spend stuff on money on that stuff. I gave my truck away so I could have a second truck on the road. Now I eyeball new trucks and I go, God, they're so expensive. I'm never buying a new they're one. They're ridiculous. I'm never buying another truck. That thing's going to have your CP4 come apart, and then you're going to have to like rebuild the whole engine, and then you'll be like, ah, I'm just buying a new one. Oh, that'll suck so bad. I'm so lazy. I don't know if I, I – you know what? I got a guy. One of our guys that works for us, I would definitely take the keys to his car, definitely park my truck behind his bay with the new parts like in the bed, and let me know when it's done, and that's when you can transport yourself out of here. <laughs> They're crazy. These truck prices are absolutely nuts. I'm never buying another one. Never again. I'm ready. I'm ready to drive a beater, I think. The problem with that is, is like, I got spoiled because of COVID, because I do a lot of work for a Ford dealer, and the guy knew I wanted to explore for my wife, and so I'd been saving my pennies, you know, because I didn't want them. It's hard when you buy a real nice one. And so we got a 2020 Explorer ST. I mean, it's got every option, and I've like become addicted to radar cruise control on my own. Radar cruise control and massaging seats. I'm like, yes. AC seats in Florida are the key, man. There's nothing better than nice, cold air blowing up here. We have like a Toyota four-cylinder. We have all sorts of stuff. And when diesel was like $6.30 a gallon here in New York, Jim was like, why don't you just drive the Camry back and forth? Like, why don't you just park your truck, drive the Camry back and forth? And I'm like, you know, like, I really like my massaging seats. (laughs) <laughs> like, I don't know if I can go back. <laughs> Look at Low's face. He's like massaging. My massaging seats is the washboard on gravel roads. Then it's a whole body massage. So how far do you drive to work? It's got these little circle things that like rub your butt. Oh my gosh, man. You have not. Oh. I drive like 28 minutes to work and I'm like, I got to have all that the little knickknacks. I don't know. I have yet to get in my wife's car. The massaging sheet isn't on and the heated seat isn't on. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's 137,000 degrees. Like they should be illegal. Like you could easily fall asleep while driving your car, but it yells at you. It'd be like getting off a lawnmower after you've been on it for a couple hours. And, you know, you- no, it's not this kind of massage. It's got balls in there that like go in circles. It's, it's weird. It's not like when I rode my zero turn to the gas station the other day. <laughs> And you get off, their legs feel like they're asleep, like your feet are hypersensitive. The Kawasaki's been over revved <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I just can't see buying a car now without AC seats. And so you can't even look at trucks that are like reasonably priced that have AC seats. And AC seats in Florida are like totally worth it. <laughs> they're totally worth it here. They're amazing. Thorson took me for a ride in his plaid and I told him he should get like a I don't know, like a bocce ball or even a bowling ball and you could set it behind your back and then he could tromp on it and you get a really good adjustment. Really good crack. Yeah. Oh my God. Between the shoulder blades, dude, that'd work like gangbusters. I, what did I just have? And it was misfire. It was an 05 GTO and it was kind of like a sleeper car. Five, seven or six. Oh, it had a six. Oh, in it. It most definitely had a six. Oh, I remember because I saw the information pop up on the scanner. It had a 6.0 in it, and it sounded like, well, it sounded really choppy when I pulled it in because it was misfire, and I popped the hood, and it's got the SLP headers, and it adjusted me when I hit the gas on it. It was, you know, and I mean, I've driven a lot of 600, 700 horsepower diesel trucks that have been tuned and deleted, but this was not like that. Like, I had to the gas hard one time, and when it grabbed second, I almost ended up in somebody's front yard. So that was like the first last time I hit the gas. I'm like, this car is ridiculous. I worked at a shop in Longwood, real high-end shop. I mean, the guy didn't say no. If you needed a factory tool, he bought it. It was a great shop to work for, but it was an hour and 10 minutes each way to get there. And I was known as the tire guy because I had just left Tire Kingdom. 
So any tires that came in, like I got stuck doing them and it was my own little slice of heaven because it was the only thing I felt I was qualified better than anybody else in the shop because they're all like 50 years old and been there 20 years. And so I turned in my two weeks notice and he goes, hey, I got a big favor to ask. And I'm like, okay, the owners never asked for a favor. It's like, we got a guy coming in tomorrow. I need you to do this set of tires. I don't care how long it takes you. I don't care if you spend all day on it. I just need it done in one day and you cannot scratch these rims. And I'm like, yeah, no problem, man. I got you. Next day I come in, it was a Corvette ZR1. And the owner's like, these are rims that are unpaintable. If you scratch them, you must buy all four rims as a set. I'm like, ah, no, we got this. We got this machine that had this like plastic head and you like mount the tires in the center is made for Porsche. The plastic head, I broke all four heads that he owned. I got every tire off without issues. And the owner told me, do not take the stickers off the rear tires of the car when you mount and balance tires. I want the stickers left on. I'm like, all right, whatever, weirdo. So I got them all done. It's like just after lunchtime because I didn't take lunch. I stayed. And the owner comes over and he goes, hey, man, you want to drive this car? And I'm like, how much does this car cost? And he goes, oh, I knew it was like 142, 100, I don't know, something ridiculous. No, it was 156, I think. I was like, dude, I paid 142 for my house. I am not driving a car that costs more than my house. And he goes, you got to drive it. It's part of the rules. The customer says what you got to do. You got to drive it. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not driving the car. It was a six speed car. It just sounded awesome. You know, he says like 900 horsepower or something out of those because it's got the supercharger in it on the L sign. It's like, you got to drive it. It's unbelievably fast. And I'm like, well, what do you drive besides this? Tell me it's unbelievably fast. He goes, I work at NASA and my other car is a Prius. I'm like, okay, I guess you understand speed. If you like work on rockets and drive a Prius. The European guy at the shop had just got done doing like an Audi A8 that was all-wheel drive with twin turbos. He pulls up and he's like, come on, Matt, let's go race. Because we knew from 100 light. I'd have just told him he should start put catalytic converters on those rockets and he probably won't feel so guilty. You don't need that Prius. It was a 78-mile drive each way. And so we did it just for gas. And so we knew from one red light to the next red light. It was kind of like Fast and Furious scene. We knew it was really close to a quarter mile. There is a train track that goes through there, which is funny. <laughs> yeah. So he's like, Matt, let's run it red light to red light and see what happens. And I'm like, I'm not racing the customer's car. Customer looked at me and goes, you're going to race it. And if you lose, don't come back. All right, all right, go drive your car. So I go to leave and the customer goes, look, I got some advice. I'm like, oh yeah. He goes, this is how you put it in launch mode. I'm like, and I was like, okay. He goes, listen, when you dump the clutch, just hammer the gas all the way down as it throws you back into the seat. Just hold on to the gear s- selector and it's just going to snatch it in a second. He goes, you'll launch it like. You'll be at 100 before you can blink. I'm like, oh, whatever. Oh, yeah, that was the most invigorating car <laughs> acceleration I've ever felt. He wasn't wrong. I mean, you just dumped the clutch, pounded the gas, and it was like, boom. I came back. Tires were like half gone already. And he's like, yeah, I get it. At every 7,500 miles, they don't last long, but man, it's fun, isn't it? And I'm like, yep. You couldn't wipe the smile off my face for the rest of the day. I didn't care what I drove. That was the most exhilarating car experience. And I did beat the Audi A8. I'm just so jealous that you could fit in it, quite honestly. <laughs> you know what? I fit into it just fine, but getting out is still a pain because it's so low and you're like down. The thing that you don't really think about is it's, it's, it's tough being big and wide, but when your boot size is a 16 triple E, what you find is to test drive the newer Corvettes, the pedal box is so small that you can't actually drive it without hitting the gas and the brake at the same time. So what you end up doing is you set a floor mat next to the car and you take your boots off and you get in the car with your socks on. And that's the only way you can actually test drive the car. Sorry, there's a weird smell in my car after you guys worked on it. <laughs> I think something died in here. Three-year-old snap on the socks that are still don't have holes on them yet. <laughs> it always made me wonder how Jeremy Clarkson could test drive a lot of them cars. Is he like 6'4", six, 6'5", six, or something? So yeah, he's like 6'5", I think. You ever gone to a Chevy dealer and looked at the Corvette techs? They're always the biggest guy in the shop. I've never understood. I'm like, why? Yeah, how did he get into all them things? I'll tell you. The newer Corvettes are worse than the old ones. c 8 Oh. Yep. The newer ones are worse than the old ones. Mazda Miatas, the door's got to be open. I can't get the clutch on a Mazda Miata with the door shut. And Ford Ranger, if it doesn't have tilt wheel, freaking, I got to drive that with the door open, too. I can't shut the driver's door. It doesn't work. I can see him on your red light opening the door in the Miata so he can take off. Yeah, it's a simple math problem. There's four inches to the left of the steering wheel, and I got a nine-inch Hamhawk kneecap, you know? So I'm thinking if you guys specialize, it should be in smart cars. Perfect, yeah. Mini Coopers. Oh, no, no. We won't be specializing in minis. I did see that picture on Facebook you posted of the VCM light. When I first looked at it, I'm like, it's like the size of a matchbox. But I was like, oh, no, it's Brian. 
Google comment that somebody said, dude, that looks like a thumb drive in your hands. <laughs> I saw it. I was like, God, I forgot how big he is. That piece of him looks small. And I saw light. And I was like, oh. It's funny. I picture a lot of people about the same size as me. And then you see somebody like me and you're like, they do make people that small. No, like when I walk up to somebody, like I told this, it was, it was actually Keith Perkins I was talking to. I said, you know, I said, it's funny. I said, I walk up to you and I feel like, like we're the same height. I feel like maybe we're roughly the same size. And I see a picture and I'm like, gosh, I must be on drugs. Like, like, it's, like it's not even close. You know, it was funny. You don't, you don't really realize it. I had never met Sean Miller and he came down for some management conference. And he's like, I really want to ride with you for a day. And I'm like, you're going to be shocked at how many dealers we go to. It's like, whatever. And it, I was had my Silverado at the time and I had stuff behind the back seat because I had so much equipment. I had stuff in the back seat and I picked him up and I was like, he ain't going to fit because I had to be kind of like more on the forward side. And I'm like, he ain't going to fit. And he like sat there all scrunched up in the seat and drove around. So the first shop, I made sure we moved stuff so he could put the seat back. Yeah, that's a real battle. I fight every day. Every other car I go to get into, you go to put the seat back. It's got power seat and you start hitting it, standing next to it. And you just hear stuff start crunching. Like who rides around with all this shit behind the seat? Like what's going on? It's all good fun until you hit the button. It's a cop car and they dropped ammo in the seat track. Yeah, right. And you're pulling it back and you're boom. And you're like, what the? But it was funny. At ETI, I had that conversation with Keith Perkins. I'm like, you know, I really don't feel like I'm that much bigger than anybody else. And then I'm seeing all these pictures. And like, there's people there that I know are as big as me or bigger. Like John Firm, Oscar Gomez. I'm like, them guys are bigger than I am. Then I see the picture. I'm like, oh, that's a little disappointing. That they're all smaller than me. And I still have to work on Mazda Miatas. Bruce Amaker, maybe? I've never met him. Do you think he's bigger than me? No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's all the press. He might be as tall as I mean, as I think you. like a linebacker. I mean, he's a big dude. I think we have a picture of me in the shop working on a canary yellow Mazda Miata doing a timing belt. It's literally on the ground. And I have one of those big, like those four foot wide snap on knee pads. And I'm doing the timing belt on my knees because it's too hard to bend over that far standing up we have a picture of it somewhere of me on a snap on knee pad reaching up into my tool cart do the timing belt on the Mazda Miata you gotta post that in a group tomorrow we have all sorts of pictures all sorts of stupid stuff me under the dash of a Jeep Liberty with my feet out the window we're at this trade show Bruce is there Bruce Amaker he's a he might be retired now but he is technical trainer mainly on Navistar only the Navistar engines well he did lots of technical training let me tell you yes you know, you'd, whatever, talking about real engines, which were the diesels, and he'd always poke fun at them. And I don't know who said something to him, but jokingly, he just takes his hand and fist and hits them together, right? And it sounds like a freaking shotgun, just boom, like, oh, I don't think I want to get hit by that guy. The real engines, yeah. I don't know if we solved anything. I don't think it's solvable. There's too much nuance involved with different situations. No, and the problem is, is so many shops run things differently, right? Like how I would do it isn't how anybody else would do it. And there's no standardized, like, it's not like a roof where you can come over and be like, oh, it's 240 square feet. And it's this much a square and that's what people Yeah, it's this much a square, take it, leave it. You can get a little variation in price. And what I mean, it'd be different if like every shop was like, okay, we know your Tesla now needs a battery, right? Like there's only three parts in your Tesla, the battery and the motor. We're just going to replace both. It's X amount of dollars. Oh, I'm going to go buy a new car. Okay. I think you said so many shops run stuff differently. Like even like even like productivity numbers. I sent my brother to a Toyota Venza, some big SUV, but they're fully loaded. Like if you ever see one, you know, it's a Venza. It got hit in the front end and it got, the bumper replaced, so the radar came off, the parking sensors were off, the 360 camera was off. Then a lot of them require seat weight calibrations afterwards. So I sent them there and I said, listen, I know you can do this. Go there. I don't care how long it takes. Do the following things on the car. I need a picture of your setup. I need a picture, all the screenshots, just like when you were out at that place in Texas. I need it just done just like that. He goes, okay, no problem. Calls me back like two and a half hours later. He goes, I already got it all done. I'm like, no way. And he's like, oh, yeah, we did several of these when I was in Texas. And I'm like, huh, he did. I looked. He had all the pictures, all the screenshots. I'm like, heck, yeah. And then I sent him to like a Mazda blind spot that I thought was going to be like a pain in the butt. Because if you've ever done one with the triangle, you know, it fails 100 times before it goes. He's like, oh, it says it's dynamic. I'm just going to go drive this. I'm like, come on. (laughs) 
I mean, it's six of one half dozen the other with productivity. Like I very much expected him to maybe do one car that day. He surprised me. But there's days where we have no productivity because I can't make a Jeep start. Yeah. I'm more interested in getting the cars fixed. I don't really care how fast they get fixed, quite honestly. As my wife used to tell me when I first started off and I had no money coming in, she's like, God, it isn't Friday. Just wait till Friday. You always seem to make make the money by Friday. Yeah, don't freak out till Friday. She's yelling at me. Don't freak out till Friday because I used to start freaking are there anybody I know we're going to pay or not? I used to freak out. It's like every time I decide that I'm not going to eat like an idiot and lose weight, like the whole key to the thing is to not get on the scale. You just don't even look. You know, everything's fine because then you get frustrated if you go a day and you don't lose a pound. Yeah, I just, yeah, I don't understand with some of these shops. They're like, oh, my guy was usually this much productive and now he's this much productive. I'm like 85%. I go, I don't know what our number is, but I don't know why guys need 85%. Nobody's eating ramen noodles and there's new boats and side-by-sides everywhere. And half the guys are driving brand new current model year pickup trucks. I think we should go work for Brian. I got a 23 year old kid that's trading his 21 F-150 for a 23 F-150 like next week. Is there job openings? I'm really good at pushing. Like this thing hard, man. Like just Show up to work and like try to do a good job and we'll have pizza and do stuff. They love pizza. Pizza and going home early. It's like any corporation. Hey, we made a $3 billion profit. What are we going to do to show our employees appreciation? Pizza party! Pizza and buy more skin tools. Fans was all excited. He got new coffee grains, I can tell. I'm about to do something really stupid. Our dongle for our Zeus broke and a new one's $985, which is annoying. Does it just snap off on it? Yeah, so the Snap-on dealer dropped off a Zeus Plus for me to use while I wait for the Zeus dongle to come in. I think I'm just going to have them sell it to us. I don't know. you got to get the whole new cart, though. The new cart looks sweet. It's got, like, little handles on there so you can lean on it. I have the old cart, and I have, like, all my dying shit in it. Like, if we get rid of the cart, I have to go buy another toolbox. But new cart with the new tool... Because when you get the $22,000 price tag, it's got red handles on there that actually act as a defibrillator. Talk about the MSRP are as crazy as the people that made up the MSRP at Snap-on. I think they shut their eyes and they just point on a board to like five numbers. Like that's what the MSRP is going to be. What's it going to sell for? Ah, uh, 6800 real dollars. But you know, the MSRP will be 13000 So they think they're getting a good deal. It's like their sockets. I, I got a Snap-on catalog the other day and saw what a... 12 point socket set cost i think i fell over it was like 300 and some dollars was the sale price and i'm like when did sockets become so expensive their lifetime warranty yeah i could buy 20 sets of gear range for that lifetime warranty at 600 it's super hard to actually find 12 point sockets gear range makes them and amazon delivers them 12 point really he's on his phone looking the amazon app uh, open already he just hit the buy it now ordered my brother a set because he didn't own a set of sockets when i hired him and i was like no problem so my wife needs some more 12 point sockets because everything on this bell helicopter is 12 point and i didn't have quarter inch 12 point sockets and neither did she have you ever seen the milwaukee pack out setup i got one for my employee he really likes it i just it. got my wife one it's billy badass no they have to be standard matthew because there's no metric Oh, these are metric and standard. It comes as a combo set for your viewing pleasure. I see you sent it to me. I'm actually really excited about that. I don't know why it has standard in there because shit's useless in the automotive world. Not in the rust world. <laughs> Use that 3.8 socket all the time to get off. Yeah, you can tell the hot movers, the 3.8s and the 5.16s always have the hammer marks on top of them. We have a podcast on how bad your guys' life sucks because you live in the rust state. And I can just laugh at you the whole time you're talking about torches and... Yeah, we need to send you videos of like just random rust type things that happen. Like when you lower the lift and just hitting the lever causes rust to fall off the car. That happens here. I mean, I've seen videos of like frames rusted so bad where the guy picks the truck up and it like folds in on itself. I had a Toyota Tacoma in a couple months ago. The guy wanted a New York State inspection and I already knew the bed was hitting the cab and he had bicycle tires between the cab and the body to like stop the screeching to like soften it. I'm like this isn't gonna pass and the gap goes like this as i'm lifting it i'm like never mind like you're gonna have to take that thing he's like well i'm gonna fix it i'm like hey good luck you have fun i went to the nuclear museum in new mexico last week in albuquerque they have like the u.s nuclear museum or whatever you go to area 51 and see the aliens the devil's tale something like that 
all good till I got to the end and it talked about the amount of missing nuclear devices in the United States of America right now and the amount of near nation ending events that we've had one in montana where a guy was working on a missile in a silo and dropped a ratchet with a socket on it on the side of this missile and i get it's like paper thin they have a model of it and the thing started leaking like liquid rocket fuel into the silo and we almost had like a nuclear event (laughs) i'm like you know what i need to get out of this museum a plane crashed in north carolina and there's a nuclear war had like sunk in the mud somewhere from where this plane crashed and they can't find it you just can't hit metal detector and be like Beep. oh look it's been beeping for like 300 feet let's look here and like they have them that have survived plane crashes and i'm like how did that thing not explode like it's all dented up and tore up and all that stuff i'm like this is unbelievable so missiles are weird if it's not activated it won't explode that's what they tell you so far nobody's died yet Well, maybe they have, but there wasn't a survivor. When they were coming up with it, the guy pulled the screwdriver out too fast and died of radiation poisoning. That's what I was referring to. I think it was called the Demon Core. Or he dropped the screwdriver and it started to go. It's super radioactive and it was encased to protect everyone. And the scientist would use a flathead screwdriver to crack it open and measure essentially the neutrons emitted. And keep this gap if you let everything touch it would go radioactive and he's the second guy involved there's already testers that died from messing around and i think i misspoke i think i said devil's tales actually the dragon's tail where that came from was dr richard feynman had said that this experiment was basically tickling the dragon's tail okay this physicist that you're talking about with that screwdriver kind of cocky doing it that way right but he let it slip and they come together and it doesn't take long. It emits lethal dose. Yeah, like he instantly tasted metal. I think he died within a couple of weeks. A couple of other people in that room died months later and then others years and years later, but all from radiation sickness. It was crazy. I think it goes like blue light. I knew that it was in it's New Mexico, but it's like Los Alamos laboratory or something like that. Exactly. I believe what it So They had the whole display, like they had the reenactment of like what happened. They had the whole display at the museum. It happened twice. It did. He was measuring something you shims didn't and the screwdriver touched. It lasted for half a second and he received a thousand rad dose of radiation and died nine days later. And then so like you get to this list of missing nuclear warheads in the United States. Uh, I mean, I got a couple of them if you want to. At number three, you're alarmed, but there's like 18 of them or something like that. I'm like, oh my (laughs) God, like, what do you mean? During the Long Island incident, there's people walked in and grabbed some. (laughs) It's bizarro. I'm like, I can't even deal with this right now. I'm like, I'm going to go outside and look at the airplanes. (laughs) I I have anxiety problems. I can't freaking read this. So thank you guys for joining me. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you to Nap Auto Tech Training for sponsoring and making this possible. And also thank you to the Aftermarket Radio Network and probably especially Tracy this time around. She's got her work cut out for her. So, we love you. Yeah, it's about time she gets a full time job. All right, until next time, everyone, take care. You've been listening to Matt Fonslow diagnosing the aftermarket A to Z on the Aftermarket Radio Network. Follow Matt on your favorite listening app. He's very interested in what you have to say. Let him know what you'd like him to cover and come on the show. Matt is all for advancing the aftermarket. Find Matt Fonslow on social media and connect or on aftermarketradionetwork.com. <laughs>